welcome to Buckets. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network. This is your Futures Friday and Best Bets episode brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Join me today on the program as NBA Futures analyst making his triumphant return as we get started and getting ready to be locked in for the NBA playoffs. It's Brandon Anderson. Brandon, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. We are, today is the last day of March. March Madness is wrapping up. April Madness is coming. Is that is that the NBA playoffs? No. We trademarked that in April Madness? It's no, not even a little bit. You gotta do the TNT thing. 40 days and 40 nights. That's what you gotta oh, do. Oh, there we go. You gotta, you gotta do that. Um, it's it's biblical, in, in some, as, as was foretold <laughs> in the ancient times. Uh, reminder, everything we talk about in today's show can be found in the award-winning Action Network app. Best way for you to track your picks, you get up the second information where the bets money are coming in, in on. You get to follow all of our futures plays that we log in the app. You can go check out Brandon's profile, check out all the stuff that he's got loaded up for not just NBA, but NFL as well. I bet baseball yesterday after listening to Sean Zarillo oh. on the Favorites podcast, put a little bet in on the Guardians to win the AL because... Yeah, Sean's really smart, and I don't know anything yeah, about baseball. and the Guardians. That is a team name that I definitely remember is a new name now. That's that's a name of a baseball <laughs> team. On today's show, we're going to do playoff picture and how to bet it, taking a look at the standings and what we expect the matchups to be. We're also going to talk about the NBA straw poll for MVP that came out on ESPN on Thursday. We'll get you some reaction to that from the MVP market, how to do that. At the end of the show, we'll also do best bets for Friday. I wasn't able to get in. Uh, our Friday episode with Jim Turvey, uh, my apologies to Jim, because I was at the Nuggets game versus the Pelicans, which was a complete waste of time because Nikola Jokic decided to sit out with a calf. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started with playoff picture and how to bet it. Brandon, let's start with the Western Conference. The Denver Nuggets are going to be the one seed as much as they may lose. Uh, they lost Thursday night and they're likely to lose on Friday night playing the Suns. They're not even going to send multiple starters to that game. Their magic number for the one seed is three. A uh, good way to put this is that the uh, Memphis Grizzlies go five and one to close. The Nuggets need to go two and four to close. They'll they face the Houston Rockets. They've got the <laughs> Kings at home in their finale when the Kings are definitely going to be resting guys. Like the Nuggets are going to get the one. Just I'm going to go ahead and spoiler alert that for you. Suns are going to probably are going to be in the four or five. Feel confident in that. Suns are going to be in the four or five. Don't think that they slide to six. Uh, so. We've talked a little bit about this with the Kings. We've talked about this with uh, some other perspectives. One side of the bracket, because for those of you that aren't hardcore NBA folks listening to this NBA podcast, um, the tournament doesn't recede. It's not like in the NFL where if a lower seed wins, they go somewhere else. It's set. So Nuggets and Suns are going to be on one side of the bracket, which means the other side is going to be the two seed Memphis Grizzlies, three seed Sacramento Kings, most likely, uh, unless one of them gets upset by the six seed, which could be the Warriors or the Wolves or the Clippers or the Lakers or um, that's it, uh, or the seven seed, which could be any number of those teams and several more, including the Pelicans. <laughs> this kind of shakes things out. Um, if we're looking at this, to me, what this presents, Brandon, is a, it's an opportunity to bet a long shot. Is that if we're like, all right, the short favorites are both on one side of the bracket. The two best teams in the Western Conference are the Nuggets and the Suns. You can make your argument for the Lakers or the Warriors, but if we're going to remove this from like, I think this team can make a run. If we're gonna, and that's a like good analysis, but if we're going to look at this more for strategically. From you have an opportunity to get a long shot on the other side of the bracket. This feels like something that you would be interested in taking a look at. <laughs> it is, yeah. I've already gotten my. Oklahoma City Thunder, 500 to one Western future in the app. This is exactly the sort, maybe not exactly. This is the sort of long shot we're talking about of, well, why Oklahoma City? Well, it's very easy because at the time, a little less so now, a couple of weeks later, at the time, they look like they might actually get out of the play-in or be at the top of the play-in. That means six or seven seed. That means Grizzlies and Kings, who are fine, who are good, who are very good Grizzlies and Kings fans, but they're not the Nuggets and the Suns, and at the time, the Warriors, who looked like they all were going to be on that half of the bracket. We all want, like, if you could bet right now, and I don't see this anywhere, I don't see it up, but FanDuel, our sponsor, I can't bet seven seed to make the Western Conference Finals. I would love to make that bet. That'd be a good one. Right now, I think that's what we're doing, right? We're trying, It's it almost is a parlay. You're parlaying, please, when I, when I bet on this team, I'm going to pick, the Warriors, the Timberwolves, the Lakers, 
please let them be the sixth or seventh seed. I'm betting on that. And then betting on the fact that if that happens, the odds bump favorably, very much so, because I would, much as you might like the Kings or Grizzlies, I want those teams in my best of seven. I don't want Kevin Durant and Nikola Jokic and the Nuggets and the Suns. I just don't. I don't want them. I think you're kidding yourself if you think that those are even halves of the bracket. I don't think anybody thinks that. So the question is, which team? Is there a long shot for you of those teams? I think it's probably not the Thunder. I don't mind the 500 to one. That's not out there. But who is it for you? Who is the team you're trying to get into that six or seven range? Well, what's interesting here, though, is I think uh, the numbers don't necessarily reflect that because you've got the Warriors might be in that side of the bracket in the three six, but they're just plus 480 because <laughs> I don't know if you know this. The Warriors have won a bunch of championships um haven't have. lost uh, this is my favorite one to throw out there have not lost a series when steph curry draymond green clay thompson play all games in that series lost in 2016 when draymond missed game five due to suspension lost 2019 when clay thompson got hurt every other series they've won they are undefeated <laughs> in all other series uh but if we look at the, this like the lakers are plus 1600 to win the west this is the problem. It's like the Sacramento Kings are plus 2000. And I've already talked about, made the case of the Kings. I bet the Kings it's in the app. What's the one that's kind of getting to me now is actually Memphis, which is a total about face. And I'm trying <laughs> to figure out how to like figure this out. The problem is, is I was off of them from the start of the year. I was off of them during the year. I can, I haven't put a, a single bet in on the Memphis Grizzlies to win the West. They're one of the only teams. I have positions on all, like, not everybody, but I got positions on a lot of teams. I got good positions on a lot of teams. Got, like, Clippers and Suns early. Bought Suns before, like, when Kyrie asked out before KD got traded. Like, all of this, like, I positioned myself well. Memphis was the one team, because I do think you you can't just bet everybody. Otherwise, you're just wasting your money. Like, you're just going to come out with pennies. Even I know that, Captain Hedge. But Memphis was the one team that I was like, I'm not betting Memphis. No. And the problem is, like, their half-court offense since the All-Star break is top 10. So now you have the one thing that I've been like, they can't score in the half-court. They're starting to do that. Now, they faced a weak opponent schedule, and that's going to have to be part of the equation here. But things are kind of lining up here where I'm like, man, if they get 2-7 and they get – the Wolves are a bad matchup, but they beat them last year, and I don't know that Rudy gets them over the hump. I don't know. That's the difference. They lost Nas Reed. If they get the Thunder in the two seven, if they get the Pels in the two seven, and Zion's not back by then, sounds like he might be. Wh- where does this kind of get to? I, I'm forced to kind of be like, wait, the, the the Grizzlies really might wind up in the Western Conference Finals. But I will say this because this is what we're really talking about: is like, can you get yourself to a big enough number that you're going to be able to profit by hedging it in the Conference Finals on the on the other team, right? Because we, you and yeah. I are both like. Well, I mean, the Nuggets and Suns are still really good. Or the Warriors, if they come out of that side of the bracket or whoever, right? But it needs to be a big enough number. And I don't know that Memphis currently plus 600 at FanDuel is enough to do that. I have a long shot, but I'm curious to hear your side of this and if there's a team that you like. Yeah, no, we, we, uh, so last features Friday when Joe Dallara and I talked through these teams and kind of ended up making effectively a power ranking system we got kind of to a similar spot with the Grizzlies. We, I, I made the case when we were, we were seeding teams. Okay. Well, the Grizzlies, they, they kind of fall after the Suns and or after the Suns potential and the Cavs, the Grizzlies have to be your next choice. They're like number five, six, seven, somewhere in that range overall. And as we talked through it, I was like, man, are, are, are we getting there? Is, is for all the time we've spent looking for the sleeper, is it, is it just the Grizzlies in that half? Should we be betting the Grizzlies? And I agree with all the things that you said, except that the most important thing is the part at the end, which is that the Grizzlies, there's a case for, hey, you know what? What if it's just the team right before our eyes? What if it's that team? What if it's them all along? That's all great. But guess what? The number, the plus 600, does not reflect the long shot that you and I have treated them as. It reflects the Grizzlies as the back-to-back two seed that they are. And... If the number reflects the record, not our perceptions, then our perceptions changing to get closer to the record isn't enough for us. Like 
I don't think there's value there. I do agree more and more surprising myself with the premise that actually, as I'm digging into this, I, I've got, uh, I think I'm going to have a couple of articles up at Action Network. So keep an eye out for them. I'll give you a little teaser here. I'm looking at parity. What, what's the parity from these teams? What happens when we get this huge middle chunk of teams? Right now, as we record this, we are a week away. We are nine days away till the end of the season. There are 15 NBA teams that can still finish above or below 500. On, on, on Basketball Reference, SRS, Simple Rating System, there are 15 teams between two and negative two, which is basically, yeah, I don't know, you're fine. That's what that means historically. That's half of the league we don't know. That's more than there's ever been in any season in NBA history. The, the next highest is there's been a season with 13 teams on that range, and we, we may still get a couple teams that move out either direction. The takeaway from my research so far as I say, okay, well, who is it then? Is the Suns? The Suns are in that group in the middle. Is it the Warriors? Is it LeBron's Lakers? They're in that group in the middle. Who comes out? Who's the sleeper? Historically, the answer is nobody. There is no sleeper. They all stink. They've told us they stink all year long, playoff wise. They're not, they're, you know, they're not the teams tanking. They're all middling average teams. And guess who's not middling and average? The Kings and the Grizzlies, just like the numbers have told us all year that they win those games. Historically, if you look at these seasons with a big cluster of teams stuck in the middle, what happens in the playoffs? Pretty much chalk. Pretty much the seeds at the top go on to the semis and then the conference finals. And maybe not necessarily the one seed comes out. Sometimes it's like the two seed or another really good team. So maybe you still do Suns instead of Nuggets if that's the case. But these middle teams, all the teams we're talking about, all the sleepers we've been trying to talk about this whole time that I have, that I've bet on, history says, no, they're just they're just not going to do it. They're not going to get there. They're not even going to get necessarily close enough to hedge. They usually don't even make the conference finals. By SRS, there's been something like, uh, I'm not quite there yet, but I think it's something like two teams in the last 35 years with an SRS below two that have made even a conference finals. And even then, it was usually because, well, there just wasn't a good team. There was nobody at the top to separate themselves. So actually, somebody had to do that. All that is to say, I think that we're at a similar spot conclusion-wise. I think that maybe it might just be Occam's Razor. It's just those teams that have been there the whole season, the Kings and the Grizzlies. The difference says, what's the Kings number right now compared to the Grizzlies? Memphis plus 600. What is the odds for the Sacramento Kings? Because it's not even close. And I think they're being treated like the Cinderella status that we kind of are trying to give Memphis, but the books aren't. But with, with the Kings, it is. Do you have the number? I don't have it in front of me. Plus 2,000, 20 to 1. Yeah. So you've been, you've been Kings all year. I've not been the Kings guy. I'm not taking any credit for it. But why are the Kings three and a half times the odds of the Grizzlies? If the Kings and Grizzlies... They're less than the Lakers. They're, they're <laughs> longer than the Lakers. Yeah, I'm I'm aware that some of the odds on this page are a little fun. When I bet the Thunder, they were they were double the odds of the Portland Trailblazers, who have shut everything down for the season. So the the, the odds, you know, there there's liabilities and other reasons. But I think given the odds, if the Grizzlies and Kings are the two and three as expected, and if they both beat these middling teams and played each other in a conference semis. Is there any chance I'm making Memphis a, a more than three to one favorite against Sacramento? No way. I don't know what I think about this series, but I know I don't think Memphis is a three and three times favorite to Sacramento. I know I don't think that. So I think I agree with your whole premise. I think the number says, okay, so Sacramento, maybe that's the play 20 to one and a hedge out if you get there. What do you think of that? Um, I love it. I've already gotten in on that, so I'm good on <laughs> on the Kings. Uh, I have to remember what number I got them at, but uh, I did. I went ahead and bet the Kings because I was like, "Hey, they might be able." Like this might under that same kind of th thought process is is where I got to. Um, you know, I think timing of this matters too. Yeah, where the Kings might have have peaked a little bit, right, and might be like a little bit on the down slide here, and it may be just one of those things where the playoffs are much harder for them than we anticipate. Like this is, a, it's a really fascinating question because their defense is so bad and their offense is so good. 
that it's hard to kind of get a feel for, you know, what is this going to look like in a playoff context? So I, I think it's difficult. Um, I think that you can make the argument for either one of those uh, teams and feel like, okay about it. I will say like, if you're in on the Grizzlies, you need to be like in on the Grizzlies. Yeah. You know, like you need to be loaded. You need to genuinely feel like that's maybe the better way to put this at plus 600. You better feel like I think the Grizzlies can win the West, not yes, just get right. there. Win you, it. You're not going to hedge out. You're, right. you're riding your ticket to the finals. That's your ticket. Yeah. Uh, I have a long shot. Okay. You ready for this one? I'm ready. I just put it in the app. 70 to one. The New Orleans Pelicans. Oh my. All right. Make so, the case. I need to hear this. <clears throat> Let me take you back. Way back <laughs> to 2022. Back in November, the Pelicans were the number one team in the Western Conference. They were the best team in the West. They beat the Suns twice. And in those games, the Suns started to pick up the injuries, and that's why they tailed off and spiraled. The Pelicans had a, at that time, were a top 10 offense and defense. They had one of the better SRS in the league back before all the injuries started to hit for them. Zion Williamson is probably going to play. Unfortunately... Grand Theft Alvarado, probably not. Alvarado's probably done for the season. That significantly hurts their bench unit. But I watched them last night in Denver, and this is a little bit of a recency thing. Um, but it's not like I watched them beat the Nuggets without Jokic and we're like, the Pelicans are world beaters. It's that if we go back and we see what this team was before, and we go, they're going to get back the main component to their team by the end of the season. <clears throat> they're in a pretty good spot to win a play-in tournament game. They might be good enough, depending on what happens. They might, might actually be able to land in the 2-7. If they land in the 2-7 and it's Memphis versus the Pelicans, that's going to be a war. Like, that's going to be crazy. You've got Zion versus Ja. You've got Zion versus Jaron. You've got the size of the Pelicans with Jonas versus like Steven Adams, who's still on the shelf, may not come back this season. The Grizzlies lost Brandon Clark. The Pels have more shooting with Trey Murphy. Like Trey Murphy's been awesome this year. Herb Jones is starting to play well. They have depth. They have combos. They have guards that can score. They've got Brandon Ingram. They have Zion, who's a singular talent. Like the Pels are the team that I realized this kind of last night. I was like, the Dallas Mavericks in 2011 had an awesome start to the season. They were so good. And in November, I was like, that team could win a championship. And then Karan Butler got hurt, and a bunch of other guys got hurt, and they kind of tailed off. Now, they finished with a much better record than the Pels, much better seeding. But if we're going to, like, if we're looking at this spot, win two series is what we're looking at. Pels 70 to 1 with the prospect of Zion returning. This is baked in with, like, I bet Zion for MVP. Shouldn't have done that. He, he's going to get hurt. Might be the same thing here. Like Zion comes back, then gets hurt again. Fine. At 70 to one, I'm willing to go ahead and bet that and set myself up for a potential long shot, ultimate victory lap. Well, and that's the thing too, like you, because of the way the bracket is breaking and because of how you've set yourself up and built the portfolio. And I know a lot of listeners have done the same thing because I've, I've been hit up in the DMS. If you've got that Kings long number, even longer than 20 to one, like I know you have, if you've got them and now you can add on some of these other teams and they end up in that same little quadrant, that same region, and it, and and I know your position on this is weakened a little bit, if you don't believe in the Grizzlies, which maybe we do now, but if we don't and we just want to fade the Grizzlies and now you get, hey, I've got a Kings long shot ticket and I get a Pelicans and oh, by the way, I got the Thunder they snuck into here or whoever the team is, suddenly you might have two of the four teams or three of the four even that get to that spot all on long numbers because you grab them at a low point. It makes sense. I'll mention a sleeper here, but before I do, I tried to pull up as you were talking and I was like, wow, Pelicans. Well, this is a surprise. Okay. Let me, let me pull up a net rating last 15 games for the team that I'm going to make the case for. Cause I think that it's been pretty good lately, surprisingly good. So I'll mention them a little bit. My team's a little further down the list. 
You know what the Pelicans' net rating is over the last 15 games? Not not the net rating. Do you know where it ranks in the in, in the one to thirty of NBA teams? No Zion. Just last 15 games, where the Pelicans rank? 14th. They're second. Whoa! They are second in the NBA at plus 7.3 at NBA.com. They're behind only the Boston Celtics. It's the Celtics Whoa. and then the Pelicans and the Sixers, Cavs, Grizzlies, Kings, Suns, all the teams we thought were good. And the Pelicans, they're second. So there you have it. <laughs> Maybe you go ahead and make that 70 to 1 bet right now. Uh, the team that I'll mention, we don't even need to talk about because we already know, and we already know it's the team I'm going to mention as the long shot because it's what I do. It's Nihilist Brandon. Look, LeBron is back. Anthony Davis is healthy. If the Lakers, after all this, get into the six or seven spot, we have to take them very seriously. They will have the possibly two best players in any game, depending on how Anthony Davis treats a paper cut that day, et cetera. They're plus 2.9 net. They're ninth over the last 15 games. Most of that, of course, doesn't include LeBron. I don't think Lakers fans seem to really, really just, just they're in on this team. Yes. Oh my God. We got D'Angelo Russell now and Jared Vanderbilt. Guess what? I've been seeing these guys for a while. It ain't going to end well for you. This is not, this is not a, a title core. If, the, if you win a title, it's because of two guys, not because of the other guys you've added. It is a more competent team. It is not what the rest of the team was the rest of the year. It is a better defensive team. It's a good enough team to be in the Grizzlies Kings part of the bracket and have Nihilus Brandon pulling his hair out because suddenly the Lakers are in the Western finals. And how did we let this happen again? And LeBron is in line for yet another finals loss. It's possible. I don't think the number really begs you to get there, but I, I do have to say right now, the Lakers are lined up to be in the seven, eight. I'm certainly going to assume the Lakers win a playing game if we're there and we're healthy. So I'm going to assume that they would be the seven seed if that's the case. So unless they drop to the nine ten, I will have to assume the Lakers are favored to win a game home or away. They'll be favored to be the seven seed then and get into this side of the bracket. The path is kind of, uh, kind of everything's coming up Lakers a little bit here. Is it, is it April already? <laughs> Brand is betting the no, Lakers. No, we're a day early. <laughs> it's April already? Um, look, I can't judge you. And it's in the app. It's, it's in the app. Uh, I bet Lakers Celtics on February 27th at 48 to one Lakers bucks at 60 to one. <laughs> so I've, I have already, I'm, I am way ahead of you, my man. Um, it's fascinating. Cause here's the thing is like, I feel like either the war, the Lakers are going to win the Western conference or they're going to be out in less than uh five games in terms of including the play-in like they're either gonna get swept or losing the play-in like <laughs> swept slash losing the play-in or win the western conference like those are the only two things i can see happening here uh yeah give, give us give us like an over under two and a half lakers postseason wins bet give us give, not not you get, get, yeah. let the books put that number up to bet well, on you know so I mean, that's a good transition is like, yeah, I was, I was just going to use that. I'll let you, I'll let you do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about round of elimination. When we get closer to next week, uh, it'll be probably late next week. They'll put it up before the end of the season, but it'll only be like with a few days left. Cause they have to get a, a better sense of where the standings are going to be. We'll have a few more things locked by the end of the next week. They'll put out round of elimination bets, which are going to be really fascinating. Um, if for no other reason than like <clears throat> it does give you some interesting opportunities if you want to go like if you want to do some small hedges because like the nuggets will probably be a big number to lose in the first round even with the time teams that they're facing like this is what's been really funny is like who is it oh people were arguing with me yesterday it's really funny how casuals nba fans that don't do the betting like they're like no, no, no. The Celtics will not be underdogs to the Bucks in a conference finals. They will not be. They, they, that is not how it will go. They are just as good. And I'm like, guys, the Bucks will have home court. Like the Bucks <laughs> are going to be favored. This is not, this is nothing to do with how you feel this game or how you feel. The Bucks are going to have game seven at home and a better record. They're going to be favored. I'm sorry. Like that's not always like the Celtics were favored last year versus the heat. Right. Like we, the Celtics were favorites in that series, but not the same thing. Um, 
round of eliminations, I think, is going to be interesting to kind of look at and target. And the key, I think, is really to try and figure out not just like first round upsets, but to try and figure out if there are teams that both of the matchups look bad. And hmm. I, it's going to be really interesting to see what those numbers look like as kind of an advance. Um, Phoenix is going to be one that I'll definitely want to see because the assumption will kind of be, it'll be heavily weighted to the second round because they'll face Denver. Yep. That's like currently the best team that they would face most likely. Um, and whether or not there'll be better value on for them to lose in the first round or to just play the series price on Clippers slash Warriors, or whether you want to like really get kind of bold here and be like, yeah, like let's plan out, you know, a conference finals loss for the Suns. What does that look like? Right. All these types of yeah. ways that you can, you can build it. So you can get creative with how to approach it. Do you have any thoughts on round of elimination? We don't have numbers yet. <laughs> We're just kind of ballparking the way to approach this when those numbers come out. Yeah, I had noted the Suns also. Like, I'm curious when the odds do come out. I think that assuming that the bracket is how it is, that the Suns would face the Nuggets in the second round, presumably. I'm assuming that second round. to Suns to lose in the conference semis, or however it will be called. I'm assuming that would be the shortest odds on the board. I'm curious what order. Like, you know, they'll list them in order. They'll list them in order of the odds. And for almost any team... The most likely outcome is you lose in the first round, and the next most is you lose in the second round. And that's how it goes with the Suns and with the bracket being weird. I sort of feel like the Suns losing in the finals should be the second most likely outcome. Ooh. That seems weird Ooh, because like it implies it. that they have to make it there. Yeah. But like if I'm looking just at the matchup, Ooh. the Suns will be favored or heavily favored, probably in the first round and in the conference finals, because it won't be against the Nuggets. So either it will be a road series against the Kings or Grizzlies, which, hey, Bucks and Celtics, guys, the Suns will be favored on that one. The Suns will be big favorites with the road. Doesn't matter. And if it ends up being a sleeper team out of there, the Suns will be even bigger favorites with home court. So they'll be huge favorites there. I don't know in the finals. I don't know how they'd match up. I don't know who's healthy. I don't know who they'd play. But I feel like that's the next likely one. So I don't know. I think that one's interesting. Two other ones that I'll mention, but but first, <clears throat> we just talked about all these sleeper teams on that softer west half of the bracket and the idea of, okay, bet the Kings 20 to 1, hedge out. Do you just do this instead? Do you just bet Kings to lose in the conference finals? Because that's the same thing we're doing. You have to hedge later. Do you just wait and whoever your sleeper is on that side, just do that? Hmm. I think it depends on whether or not you think the Kings can win one of the first two games of the series of the yeah. finals, right? Because on the road, presumably, <clears throat> right? Which, because... the, the, which the Kings are the one Western team with a good winning road record, by the way. Yeah, or not? Like, what if it's Lakers, right? Like, if it's Lakers, they'd be at home for for game one or two, and as long as they can win one game versus like the Lakers or the war or the Warriors, conceivably, if they would go into the four or five Clippers, sure. right? If if you're just like if you believe the West is open and you're like, it's not going to be one of Phoenix or Denver or it's not conclusively enough. Yeah. then there's probably value. And I, I think playing the, the, the Kings to win the West instead of the, the, the round of elimination, it, depending on like, we're again, yeah, that makes blind, sense. but game and number that's, that's how I would approach it. And then be like, as if the Kings win game one, like that's what you hope for is like, you hope the Kings win game one so that you can then come back on the other team. That's your hedge. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So I, I think that's one way to look at those West sleeper teams. Two other ones that I want to see odds for that that I think will be numbers priced in my favor. We've talked a couple of times about the one team in the East outside of that top four that I think can't necessarily make a run. I don't know if they have multiple series in them, but I think the Miami Heat can can contend to win a series. So Heat to lose in the Eastern semis. I think they can win one. I don't think they have multiple wars in them to win. And I don't honestly super care a lot if they end up having to face Boston or Milwaukee or Philly. I think Miami can beat any of those teams. If wow. if the Miami shows up that I would need to show up to win a series, then it's have to be because the defense is elite and Jimmy is elite. And if that's the case, then they could beat those teams. They probably won't. They're probably just going to lose. 
But if the, if the version of Miami that could beat someone shows up, I think they could beat any of those teams. I just don't think they'd do it again. So rather than play the first round series, playing them to win and then lose effectively. And then the other one, I'll go with another Eastern semis. Give me the Sixers or whoever you don't like, Boston or Philly, you're going to play one of those teams in the second round. It's going to be both of those teams in the second round. I'm going to bet Philly, who I don't like, don't want in that series. I'm betting Boston against Philly. We know this about me. I will never bet Philadelphia in these playoff series. I don't trust them. I want to bet Philly right now because Joel Embiid might break his face in the first round and not be in in that series. And now I lose the price or because we're still pricing a little extra in whatever, whatever happens. We don't know for sure that it's Celtic Sixers. So because of that, the books have to juice the number a little bit on the possibility that all right, Boston could lose to whoever Boston could lose to Miami or Toronto or whatever. It could happen. It could happen in the first round. So I'm just going to bet whoever I don't like in that matchup for me, it's the Sixers to lose in the Eastern semis because I'm going to get a better price now than when I just wait and bet the second round series. Cause I think it's those two teams either way. I don't really care who they play in the first round in all likelihood. Right. And we have to be able to project out what the prices would be for those series and know if the rollover is, would be a better approach there. Um, sure. That's true. The rollover is another way to do that. Yeah. So that we'll have to, we'll have to break down those numbers next week. We have to work on that. Uh, you probably do the Eastern conference. Let's go over that real quick. Uh, So Knicks Cavs is going to be the four or five, just spoiler alert. That's going to be done. It should be locked up by, by the weekend at the latest, by the end of the weekend, we should be locked into four or five Knicks Cavs. Uh, people will still talk about like, well, the Sixers could be, no, 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 it's going to, it's going to be Knicks Cavs four or five guys. We're, I'm telling you, like it's, we're, <laughs> that's what we're getting. Yeah. yeah big um, umbrella statement here. There's nine days left and yeah. two and a three game lead or deficit in the standings ain't changing in all yeah. likelihood. It's, it's a lot more than we think. <laughs> uh, no Randall for the rest of the regular season, which increases the odds of the Knicks being in the five and not the four. Um, there's some talk that he could miss the start of that round. <clears throat> My challenge here is like, this is a specific spot in time. Um, I'm trying to talk through this with you. The Celtics are technically alive to get the one. It's very, very unlikely, but they are alive after taking that game last night. They're going to at least put a little bit of pressure on the bucks. Okay. I like the Cavs versus the Celtics a lot still. I yeah. just, I like that matchup. I don't like the matchup versus the Bucks. At the same time, the Bucks had this amazing run, and now I feel like they're overpriced in the market as somebody that has bet them so often in the playoffs through the years and have talked about in this pod incessantly about how they just missed shots. I don't know if their floor is high enough to get them past Cleveland in all permutation, like all reasonable permutations of that series. Like the Cavs do have firepower. They do have Donovan Mitchell. They do have Darius Garland. The bigs are going to have a hard time because it's Brooke Lopez and Giannis. And those are monsters. I get it. I don't know who that other guy's going to be for Cleveland. If you say like, it would have to be like Levert. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. Um, Isaac Okoro has actually been playing sneaky well and actually like hitting some pretty big shots lately. That sounds crazy, but I'm like, is it crazier for it to be Isaac Okoro or like Jay Crowder, who's been historically not a great shooter or whoever, you know, like the Bucks have these choke up of situations and it might be Boston where I would very much be interested in betting Cleveland, at least on the series spread line in that spot. Uh, I know you guys talked about this on the pod last week. Is there a little bit of value on the Cleveland Cavaliers to make the Eastern conference finals uh, this season. I don't think I can quite get there. We, we did talk about it and the, the profile for Cleveland, just to kind of rehash some of the things that we talked about last week. The problem with Cleveland's profile is that the numbers are, are I think they're lying to us a little bit. Yeah. The, you know, the net rating, the SRS, the numbers that I love, these are the numbers that I go to as much as anybody. The Cavs are effectively number one or close to number one in, yeah. in all of those ratings. They're number one in defense, but they're doing that and they're getting that those hive ratings very, 
very much because of beating up on all the bad teams. Uh, this is not updated. This is a week old now. But as of a week ago, the Cavs were 31-7 and seven against teams below 500. That's awesome. And that's really, really important in the regular season to get to the seed where Cleveland is at now. It's going to get them home court in this first round. And who knows, maybe a future round if there's an upset or something. That's really important. The Cavs are 30-9 and nine in 10-point games. That means they've only been blown out nine times. That's good. That's a low number. It means they've blown teams out 30 times, maybe more now, because there's another week of numbers in there. And I'm going to guess a huge part of those 30 blowout wins are against those sub-500 teams. When the playoffs start and you're the four seed, you're done playing sub-500 teams. There might be one or two that sneak in down to the bottom, but it ain't going to be for the Cavs anymore. And even Cavs Celtics, I agree. It's been, they've played them well this year. As far as I remember, the Cavs are three and one against the Celtics, all three wins, which came in overtime. They're very good entertaining games, but we also know that overtime and close games is very coin flippy and they could just yeah. as well be on four if they lost those three games in overtime to them. And we think about them very differently. So I want to be careful with their profile. I don't really think that for me, the Julius Randall injury moves the needle on my analysis of them. And that's not to put, say nothing bad about the Knicks or about Randall. The playoffs start slow for a while, you know? So yeah. two weeks was the initial reporting. Two weeks is the play-in, all right? Well, we still have four days of that. Then there's Saturday, Sunday, there's a game, and that's going to be in Cleveland. So they're probably going to lose that one anyways, the Knicks. And then we wait, like, until Wednesday, and now we got to game two. And now it's like we're, we're almost to four weeks until Randall would get to, like, a home game three for New York. So I'm not sure that moves the needle. Here's the reason that I wouldn't bet on Cleveland right now, even if even if we really like them. I don't think that the Cavs are going to just like sweep the Knicks. I don't think the Cavs are just going to make quick work of in this yeah. first go around in the playoffs. I think even best case scenario for them is you get to 2-0, maybe Randall missed one or both of those. You go to New York, Randall's back in the lineup. You get the home Madison Square Garden crazy. The crowd's great. The Knicks win. It's two to one. Oh man, do we have a series here? And I think you just wait until then. And now you can bet the Cavs or maybe the Knicks win both at home. And now it's two, two best of three. And now you can bet the Cavs. And I think then you're going to have more information. You're going to get a better number. You, you, who knows by then, like, I guess the way you don't get a better number is if like, oh, the Bucks lost Giannis or like so, some injury or something. We lost the number, but well, the path changed a lot too. So that's kind of part of the gag. So okay. I think even if you like them, you got to wait for that playoff series spot. I'm really excited that you said this. Like, this is great advice. And I'm like, I'm already like, because I was just thinking about betting the Cavs. And now I'm like, wait, wait, no, he's right. I'm waiting because you're absolutely right. This is going to be a closer series, but they're not going to lose it. It's going to be a closer series. Yep. If we can get the 2-2, two -two, that price on the Cavs is going to be beautiful because yep. the implication is not just, well, they could lose here. There'll be a market reflection of like, they're not going to, I mean, if they were struggling with the Knicks, they're not going to beat the, the Bucks or the or the Celtics. Get out of here. But that's not how this works. We've seen this a lot where like a team struggles in the first round and the second one's a totally different matchup. Um, one thing, and by the way, I will, I will, I just looked this up. So it's a, a good data point to counterbalance. You're right. The, the Cavs beat up on the bad teams. I just looked this up on uh, Clean the Glass. So this is versus top 10 point differential squads this season. Okay. The Cavs are 11 and 15, which is the, uh, it's not awesome. It's not it, bad. It, it's not bad. They are one, I'm looking at this up, two, three, four, five. 13th uh, in record versus those teams, which are like, eh. But here's a bigger one. They're third in point differential. Hmm. So the okay, more so that, those like, ratings are still holding up. They should have performed better versus those teams. Even with the yeah. overtime wins, they've actually underperformed where they should have. They should have more wins versus those teams than they do. So that's positive. Uh, by the way, if we're going to look at the stat, it's important to note the Boston Celtics are 16 and fucking eight. 16 and <laughs> oh, eight. Man. Memphis is second at plus 3.6 point differential. Hmm. Boston's plus 6.2. And you'd be like, well, well, yeah, I mean, the well, let's be night. fair. I would have loved to see that number before last night when you let's were beat Milwaukee up. by 7,000. Let's, let's actually look <laughs> it up and see what the, uh, like, how much 
that one individual game moved it up because that's actually a really good question. I gotta look this up. Let's do 29th. Okay. Apply the filters. <clears throat> They were 15 and 8, obviously, before last night's game. Yeah. They were still plus 4.6. Okay, so still solidly in number one, just not like multiple Twice standard deviations ahead of the field. <laughs> right, right. Uh, okay, so, but anyway, that, that's the play, is to wait on Cleveland and bet them when they go down in a series. Yeah. Um, let's talk Sixers-Celtics quickly. So yeah, I, I, we haven't had you, like, you, you've been on, you may have talked about this last week. I need the spiel. I need the, why are you not betting? Like, why are you <laughs> staying true to, no, okay. I'm still not betting the Sixers. Okay. So here's the spiel. Joel Embiid and James Harden. That's it. That's the spiel. That's it. That's it. I'm not betting on Joel Embiid and James Harden. It's the playoffs. The Celtics are really good. They've been there all the years. They win a lot of series. Glenn. They were in the finals. Yeah, the, that's fair. I, I, I let Raheem mention Glenn, Raheem Palmer, our colleague. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't mind Glenn. I, I can handle Doc getting in some playoff games. Boston's really good. Look, we did the thing earlier when we we talked about your Pelicans. They're number two in net rating. The Celtics are plus ten in the last fifteen games. And yes, of course, if we rule last night's game out, that number would drop a little bit too. Celtics are still pretty good, and they they were the team. That until like the All Star break, they were the team we treated as the juggernaut number one team all season long. They were. They're not anymore because they've fallen back a little bit. But I don't think they've fallen back by as much as we think. And I still think of Boston and, and Milwaukee as a top two tier. Not that Philadelphia has definitely been very good. They've closed the gap. They moved into that uh, on the podcast with Joe last week. We both rated Philadelphia ahead of Denver. Three Eastern teams ahead of anyone from the West. That's a lot of respect for me, noted Philadelphia hater, to give the 76ers. I'm giving them third. Third is still behind first and second. Celtics are second or first. I, I, I just can't do it. I can't bet on, on Embiid and Harden in a playoff series, given all that we've seen. I've said it and said it and said it. They're just going to have to take my money and prove me otherwise, and then I will readjust where I'm at on it. I have to see it happen against a, a great team. I can get there easier than I ever have been able to. He still struggles with the double team. Michael Pena had a very good piece in the ringer that actually talked about how, like, it was a very well-built article of, like, hey, like, here's how great Embiid's been at scoring over double teams. This is probably not the way you want to do this. But it was, like, very well-balanced. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the numbers on Harden versus or of Embiid versus Horford are really good in terms of his individual production, but he loses the games. Like, his record versus Horford is still terrible. Um, they lost season series this year. It's been that that team. If it's not, if they can't beat them this year, they're never going to beat them. The formula is basically Embiid dominates Horford finally. Robert Williams isn't healthy, which seems likely. Celtics miss threes because, like, the Celtics really are just if they're hitting threes, they're going to win. Yep. If they're not hitting threes, you're going to win. That's where they've been. Uh, it, it has a chance of being a really good series. You know, I think the the Bucks obviously the, a lot of this gets into like. Can the Bucks, if the Celtics take over the the one spot, then the Sixers, I think, might be a little bit more live because it's like you just prolong that Celtics series. Maybe there's an injury. Maybe there's, you know, it, it opens the door for randomness. Maybe the Celtics are exhausted by a Cavalier series that goes longer than they thought. Um, all these types of scenarios. But, yeah, I still, as long as the Celtics are in the Sixers' way, I still can't get in on the Sixers. The Celtics have just had their number. Um, let, let, let me ask you this quick to wrap up here. Cause I, I didn't give very good analysis. So let me give one extra actual piece of analysis here other than James Harden and Joel Embiid. James Harden, I think would have a miserable series with Marcus smart and all the guys Boston is going to throw at him. I think that knowing the way James Harden has faded in playoffs in the biggest games and moments he just has. And with all the perimeter defenders that Boston could and would throw at him. Can Embiid has been awesome. Joel Embiid is awesome. He probably could have an awesome series. Can the Sixers hang with and beat the Celtics if James Harden is subpar, no matter how good Joel Embiid is? No. 
I don't think so either. And to me, this is not even about Embiid. I'm going to make my jokes. I'll make my Embiid jokes. But I, I don't think they can do it without Harden, who is equally as important to what they're doing. I don't think it'll happen against Boston. I also don't love the whole, like, he's probably going back to Houston this summer. And, like, teams, when they know that they're being broken up, don't play well. I yeah. Just, the, I will tell well, you. We like, can get to I, that one, two, three Cancun vibe very quickly in any game at any time there. You've got a week. Before next week's episode, I need you to help me figure out the best way to maximize profit on betting Boston. Because after mm. like being like, they're going to regress, they're going to regress, they're going to regress, they regress. <laughs> I'm just still looking at a short number. Yeah. Um, They're the team I want to bet right now the most in the Eastern Conference. That's not built off of last night. It's like, it's stuff like that stat that I told you about the record versus these other teams and just the whole thing. I'm just like, boy, this looks like Boston to me. Uh, All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the straw poll. We'll talk about some of the spoilers next week when we've got... Uh, a little bit more of the play in tournament locked up. All right. Straw poll comes out on Thursday. <clears throat> Fascinating results. I nailed this in my projection of what the first place votes would look like. I said it would be 40% Jokic, 40% Embiid, 20% Giannis. Hmm. And that's basically what we had. That's almost entirely what we had. Uh, Jokic finishes with two more first place votes, but loses by two points on second point, second place votes. Lost it uh, in the electoral college. The electoral college. <laughs> so my big mistake that I'm having to correct internally is this was my assumption because this is and this is like selection bias. The people I talk about MVP most with are people that are most likely to think like I do, which is like sure. it's Giannis. I have it Giannis and then Jokic. That's how I voted in straw poll. I have Giannis, Jokic, and then Embiid. Shout out to Shea Gillis Alexander for getting my fifth place vote. Uh, my where I was wrong is I assumed that there would be mostly like if you have Giannis you're gonna have Jokic second if you have Jokic you're gonna have Giannis second and instead <laughs> Embiid just got a ton of these second place votes and that honestly to me puts probably some value on him when it's this close um, recency bias has been difficult to track here I think <clears throat> The arguments and resentment against the idea of Jokic winning three times is still very much in play. I think that's been enduring. The conversation may have cooled, but I think that that sentiment endures. Embiid missing Monday's game, which was hilarious, just so hilarious that he missed the Monday game versus the Nuggets. Came back, played great, got that win versus the Mavericks. So glad that calf cleared up. Um, That will probably have faded by the time the ballots are due. So at this point, the market is all over the place. Like it's, it's just, the market is a mess. It's going to have to be a mess with how close this is. Uh, Embiid's minus 130, Jokic is one is 110. If you haven't bet this yet, which is surprising if you've been listening to this podcast this long, <laughs> um, you need to bet Embiid. If you have a large Jokic position and you need to hedge, you need to bet Embiid. Like I will tell you that I think Embiid's going to win. That's not, I can't give you like a really smart edge to find here. Except that to me, especially after the two, the Thursday night game versus Boston, Giannis is done. That sucks for me. I had a lot on him. I had great positions on Giannis. It sucks that it doesn't work out. He's going to be the one seed. Everyone agrees that he's the best player in basketball. He's not going to win this award. I feel like right now, if you're betting, it needs to be Embiid. And if you don't have an Embiid position, you're not going to get a better price than this. And you need to get it now. Okay, so I have a pretty different interpretation of the straw poll. I trust yours better because uh, j- just to be very clear, are you are you a voter in the straw poll? Yes. Are you a voter for the actual MVP? No. Okay, I knew that. I just want to make sure that our, our listeners know that. So your vote is in there, and clearly with with your NBA experience and sourcing that you have. You know the voter base better than me. You don't know what they will do, but you certainly have a better feel for it. I want to run by you. I like just studied the data yesterday and try to think, okay, we're at 10 days out. Where do we go with this from here? Here's how I interpret it. But I want you to tell me if you feel like my interpretation is off because I think it's possible. Number one, I see the data. I see him beat in it, literally a dead heat with Jokic. My interpretation, I think Embiid is in trouble. If, if if Joel Embiid, after all the push, after everything that everyone has done for the last month, after, let's call it the perk conversation, after his big push and all the Sixers fan push, after 
Jokic's team took two weeks of vacation mid-season. After all of that has passed, he still can't take a real lead in the MVP race. He still is tied for MVP. That is problematic for me as a possible Embiid backer. That's So that's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two, nine days left. I think Giannis is not going to win this. You kind of said that takeaway. Obviously, there was a chance that maybe that last night the Bucs beat up on the Celtics. The Bucs have another few big games left. They could have opened up like a six-game lead on the whole NBA. I think if you just skip the whole NBA season, if you were if you were the Brandon of NFL, but you just kept on going right through February and March, and you woke up today and you're like, April 1st, what's happening in the NBA? Oh, oh, the Bucs. They're the best team. They're the number one seed. And they're the top team out there. And oh, Chris Milton has basically just not contributed yet this season because he's been injured all year. Oh, well, Giannis is the MVP, right? That, that would be the clear, obvious conclusion that you would yeah. make just on those things. I agree. But where we're at, I don't think it's going to be Giannis. And because of that, look, we, you and I, you and I may not be voters for the MVP. We're voters in other things. And whether you want to vote for one of the two candidates in things or not, it's not fun to vote for the third party. Nobody wants to be the Green Party voter here. I think Giannis voters, there was like 20 of them. I think they're going to feel like they need to pick a side. And we've talked about this before. If you were a Giannis voter, if you were, what things led you to vote for Giannis? It was best team. It was advanced metrics. The things that might have led you to choose Giannis and not Embiid or Jokic, I think lead you to choose Jokic over Embiid. If you're choosing one of those two, and I think not all, but I think some of those Giannis voters are going to feel like, all right, I got to pick a side. Holy cow, this race is coming down to my vote, maybe. My vote matters. I have to pick a side here. And I think those people picking a side because they're Giannis voters are more likely to pick Jokic. I think it's more likely that Jokic wins than I felt going into the straw poll yesterday. Okay, it's a good case. Uh I can't get there. I think, I think actually I have a misunderstanding of a lot of Giannis voters are not analytically centric. And so they're going to be built very much based off of like, my guy can't win with the title. <clears throat> I'm not giving giving Jokic three MVPs without a title. Ah, I'll give MB one. This is also part of it is like, there's a big default of like, eh, like MB wants it really bad. Like he hasn't gotten one. Like there's, this is a real sentiment. This is how close it is. I think if it was wider, if there was a wider gap, or I think more accurately, if they saw it the way you and I do, which is that there is a wide gap here, you'd be right. The problem is just like all of the evidence and facts and like reasoning that you and I have done, people still are just like, yeah, but it's close. And we're like, but it's not, it's not like, this is not a close well, thing. And, and let's be clear to our colleagues. That's not us saying we're smarter. You guys are wrong. That. You and I have decided on our analysis yeah. that there's a bigger gap. And I think the gap is a little less than it was when I've said it was a bigger gap too. Yeah. You're like, and has closed the gap. Oh, so yeah, let's be fair sure. to our colleagues. We're not saying the other idiots just can't figure out how big right. the gap is. This is our judgment. Yeah. And, and I mean, like, here's a good example of it, right? Is like, you know, this is, I've talked about this about how EPM doesn't predict the MVP. It reflects the vote. Yeah. Jokic is plus 8.3 and beads up to, to second and plus 7.3. Um, yeah. Before we get out of here, you did the work on this. <laughs> Look, I'm just my here's my point. I'm not trying to like trash him. He's young. I'm just saying I'm never betting Luka Doncic for MVP preseason again. I'm not doing it. Yeah, when when we did I bet a, the lot, I bet a lot on Luka preseason, man. Like I bet a lot. I had to I, I have had to dig out of that hole aggressively. So I don't I don't think you should have bet Luca as heavily as you might have because I thought that the number was too short. So I can't defend you on that. I don't think you're wrong to have a strong position on Luca. I personally think that based on the evidence that we have and the numbers that we have, that Luca should at the very least be clearly top four in MVP. And I would put him higher if I were voting. Yes, wow. that means higher. That means above one of the other three. I'm not wow. going to go there, but that's how I would vote. Wow. Luka Doncic, who you voted for because your case was, he's going to have the ball a lot, do a whole lot of usage and put up huge numbers. Guess what? He has. Yeah. He's averaging 
33 points, nine rebounds, and eight assists as a 23-year-old. It's ridiculous. It's one of the all-time great seasons for a 23-year-old or an anything-year-old. It's an incredible season. Here's some numbers for you because I, I, I did the work on it. So 33, 9, and 8. That's Luca. 38, and 8. We've seen by Oscar Robertson, Russ, MJ, now Luca. That's it. That's the group. That's the 38 and 8 group that Luca is about to join. 27, 7, and 7. The old LeBron number, right? We've seen that done in NBA history 26 times ever. In in so once every three years in NBA history. LeBron, Oscar, Luca, four times now by age 23. Russ, Havlicek, and then once each for Jordan, Bird, Wilt, Harden, Jokic. 26 times. You sort that group by box plus minus, the stat that I go to on, on basketball reference, which only goes back to like the 70s. Sort it by that. In that 27, 7, and 7 group, the top seven guys, the, so Luca is seventh in that group by BPM. So it's not just the numbers. It's above and beyond those numbers, and it's efficient. Of the, of the six guys ahead of him, five dudes won MVP. The other one is 1989, Michael Jordan, who that was one of the closest MVP races of all time with him, Barkley, and Bird. And he he got plenty of votes on that one. So historically, anytime somebody has a season, anything like this, and his season is in the top echelon of the group, you win MVP or you are right there in it. I post the numbers on Twitter. Draw your own conclusions. I'm not making the conclusion for you. If you just take age 21 to 23 season. That's how old Luca is right now. These last three seasons, just take those three, put them next to age 21 to 23. Michael Jordan. Yeah. I said the name. That's his first three seasons, Put them next to him. It's, it's the office thing. They're the same picture. Like the numbers are very, very similar and the advanced metrics and all the things. And I'm not saying Luca is Michael Jordan. I'm not saying, you know, I'm going to get clips saying it anyway or whatever. If anyone is in this conversation at all, which it is inarguable that he is at least in the mix with all these numbers, you should not be getting like a few stray fifth place votes in a straw poll MVP. Oh, Luca, he played this season? 33, 9, and 8. I forgot about that. Did he do some stuff? His usage has been insane. By the way, Luca doesn't lead the league in usage. Did you know that? Do you know who leads yeah, the league in usage for, for basketball reference? Yeah, he slid off. Well, he's, he's, I mean, still second. He's still slightly ahead of Embiid. Giannis actually is number one in usage. <clears throat> yeah, so yep. I wasn't expecting that, but obviously with Chris doing no, last, but uh... I just think we're ignoring Luca way too much on, we're airing too much on the side of, I won't do it. I won't give it for the numbers. I want wins. We got to have wins. I only can look at that. Like Luca has been insane. If you take him off of that roster, they're probably like a 20 win team. Look. And I, I think that that should still get credit. I didn't have him on the straw poll. I didn't have him at all. And I don't feel bad about it. Um, there are things about this that like, look, I, I, I lean on metrics as much as anybody, but I don't, they can't define the entire thing. Oh, for sure. No one whines. No one whines. Like one of the oh. really worst <laughs> bad vibes guys this season. Bitches at teammates. Like he got off balance the other day on a runner passed out of it to Tim Hardaway Jr. with a pass that wasn't great. Hardaway pump faked, drove, and put up a floater, missed it. Luca was, like, slightly open in the baseline and, like, sat there doing the hands thing. What are you doing? It's just, like, he's just – but he does, he got out of shape midseason. After the, when he came back from injury, he wasn't in shape. Like, he take, his shot selection in late-game situations pains me. Uh, I understand the production is the production, but I cannot say that he was one of the five most impactful guys towards his team winning this season. Even like right. in the wins, I can't get, that's my definition of valuable is I, I can't say that he was one of the five most impactful guys towards his team winning. Even if you like factor in how bad the roster is, which I don't like to do. I'm always like the roster is what the roster is. Your job is to raise it up. You're supposed to make it look good. That's the job. Um, so I, I just, I will say that going forward, there will be an opportunity to bet Luca mid season at a minus number when he's going to win it. And I will just do that. That's fine. Yeah. I, 
uh, Luca is going to be like a top two or three candidate heading into next season. He's yep. going to be, he might be the favorite again, especially if he has like a nice playoff series or something. And, and we end on a nice note, he's going to be, I think Luca is going to win an MVP in the next two years. I also will probably tell you not to bet him when we start the preseason <laughs> podcast yeah. next year, because he's going to have too short of odds short of number. and yep. he's probably not going to come right. in, in shape. He's going to start slow. <laughs> You are a hundred percent right. I I am going to be in on the long shots and then bet in season shorter guys. That's, that's going to yeah. be the, the play next year. Uh, before we get out of here, let's do best bets for Monday. Oh, yeah. Brandon, you almost never does best bets with me. On the Friday, show. Friday, best bets, Friday, best bets. What day is it? Uh, Friday, best bets. Brandon almost never does best bets with me. Excited to have them. Uh, I have three plays for the weekend. We'll go ahead and we'll go around the slate and we'll say what our bets are. And then we'll come back around uh, and we'll give the cap on them. I've got the Sixers minus six and a half it's now down to minus five versus the toronto raptors uh i've got the nets in a pick em. they're actually now one and a half point dogs versus the atlanta hawks uh and i've got the cleveland cavaliers minus five and a half that's down to three and a half versus the new york knicks brandon what's your best bet for friday my best bet is i got the oklahoma city thunder i got them at minus one and a half in indiana at the pacers SGA has moved since then to questionable. So I still see a three and a half out there. I still like it at that number. Okay. Uh, Sixers. This is uh, this matchup is a nightmare for the Raptors getting, getting yak does not even this number enough from like what we saw in the playoffs last year uh, and B beat them injured. Like this, this is a bad matchup. We faded the Raptors last year. It worked out. Uh, I still like this matchup. I got this at six and a half. So I lost a point and a half. I'm fine with that. The Sixers are, past their like they had their little dip over they faced it was really weird because it was like well the sixers are losing and it's like okay they lost to the bulls fine whatever they went back and beat the bulls second game uh they had a back-to-back versus the warriors and the suns and then they punted the nuggets game like mo- all those without harden uh so with all these things things back in in flow i will go ahead i make this way more i wake this way more than five so mm-hmm. i will take the philadelphia 76ers minus five uh, I will also take the Brooklyn Nets here as a plus money versus the Hawks. I can't look, I keep, I, I have tried to be as harsh as I can be on the Nets and their performance simply does not dictate getting to the kind of numbers that the market is reflecting it. Like the market's treating this team, like they're essentially like a minus five. Like look at this, uh, this on neutral court here. Like the Hawks are going to be favored by like five points on neutral. What Hawks team are you watching? Like what? <laughs> they literally can't get themselves out of 500. They will always be 500 after almost every single game. It's amazing. Uh, I will go ahead and I will grab the points with the Brooklyn Nets. I also like the under in this game. It's at 240 and a half. I think this will be a much more of a defensive game. The Hawks can, or the Nets can switch everything versus the Hawks. That should be pretty effective. Nets offense is inconsistent. Uh, I will get there. Late addition, by the way, this wasn't in my best bets on the, sh- on the sheet, but I am also uh, tailing J Money. Uh, on Lakers mm. pick them versus the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, I will go ahead and ah. grab that. Nas Reed's injury, probably worth at least taking a look at uh, the Lakers at a small number there. Uh, and finally, uh, I'll take the Cleveland Cavaliers minus five and a half. This is now three and a half versus the Knicks. I haven't bet it yet, so I'm actually going to grab the, this three and a half here. Um, again, this is like a numbers play. There's I can't think of any reason why the Knicks without Julius Randle should be anywhere close to this number um make sure to keep an eye on injury reports but be be cognizant be, be, be careful because uh jared allen's doubtful in this game they struggle in that situation um isaac Okoro is going to rest in this game as well uh with knee soreness but the rest of the guys should be good to go that should be enough to get past the knicks without julius randall at home i'll take the the, the Cavs minus three and a half all right i like it I'll make the case for my one, and then I'm going to give you another uh, a half angle and see if you want to talk me into it or out of it. It's it's a half baked. I, I need your help on it. So, okay. case for the Oklahoma City Thunder, Thunder are the better team. The Pacers are trying to lose at this point, I think, and get the better draft pick, get the ping pong balls. I know the Thunder have not had a great week. They are struggling to put away these teams that are also looking for ping pong balls. We don't know if Shea plays. Obviously, the line is now indicating that he might. So I think that that's the expectation. Obviously, they're much better that way, but Jalen Williams has been awesome. Jalen Williams is so good and so, so much good. fun. I was watching G League playoffs the last couple of days and seeing some, you know, these guys where I kind of forget that they exist. Like they they got drafted and I followed them and then I'm like, oh, forgot about that guy, not in the NBA anymore. And I'm like, oh, 
this is where I thought Jalen Williams would be playing right now, looking super awesome, maybe, in the G League this time of the year. Instead, he's doing it in a playoff race. So he's been awesome. Gady, the defense is very good. Numbers here, since January 1, Oklahoma City is eighth in net rating on the season. It's dipped a little bit now since the break. Obviously, Shea being there helps that number. The Pacers are 27th in net rating over the same span this calendar year. So Indiana's lost 709. Oklahoma City has won 10 out of 15, even with this little blip. OKC is 20 and 8 against sub 500 teams, also, which the Pacers extremely are. Uh, Halliburton, Buddy, Turner all sat last game. The Pacers are always a threat to have some late scratches, too. So I like OKC. That's the bet. Uh, even minus three and a half, you need to. I probably would wait and make sure SGA is playing at that point. Otherwise, yeah. you're just kind of giving away some points there. Yeah. Here's my other one. So I have this in my notes as a possibility. I was looking at the Hornets against my Chicago Bulls, and it was like a plus seven and a half for the Hornets. The Hornets have been kind of like, you know, screwing around with other teams' plans lately. <laughs> they're they're messing some things up. They beat the Thunder. They beat the Mavericks twice. They're 11 and eight since just before the break. However, as I had that in my notes, the line has now jumped to 10, 10 and a half. The Hornets are sitting guys. Gordon Hayward is out. He's been really important to them. Probably their most important player this year. So here's my possibility here. Six of the eight losses in that 11 and eight stretch are by double digits, which is where this line reflects. So I think it's possible the Hornets just lay an egg and the Bulls are pushing for the play in. And that's that. So I don't really want to play the spread anymore but it's me i like a little long shot so i think if i want to play the hornet